Elke dag zit u met zoveel vragen. Iedereen zoekt naar antwoorden. Persoonlijke antwoorden die ons kunnen sterken in ons geloof. Die antwoorden liggen soms voor het grijpen. Bereid u voor op Gods woorden die door de Bijbel tot u spreken. En vind de antwoorden met Belis Conley. Hier is Belis Conley. One of the substantial yet overlooked features of Christ's ministry was that of compassion. A number of times throughout the Gospels, it is stated that Jesus was moved with compassion. And wherever you find such a declaration, significant things, often supernatural things, accompany it. They happen in connection with it. And one of those things that accompanies that that declaration where he was moved with compassion is healing. We find such an example here in Matthew's Gospel, the 14th chapter. Look there with me if you would. Matthew chapter 14 and verse 14. It says, And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. Compassion literally moved him and motivated him to heal the multitudes. But it wasn't just with multitudes, it was with individuals as well. Look with me in Mark's gospel, the very first chapter, Mark chapter 1. Mark 1 in verse 40. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. Both with multitudes and with individuals, Christ was moved with compassion and it brought healing. In fact, these are just a few token examples. Again and again and again and again and again in the scriptures, you will find mercy and compassion, always in connection with healing. It's referred to as a mercy. It's referred to as a compassion. In fact, in the New Testament, those two words are basically interchangeable. And here's the good news. Hebrews 13 and 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same compassionate, merciful Savior here in our midst as he was when he walked the shores of Galilee and ministered to individuals and ministered to multitudes. He is the same. In fact, Hebrews 2.17 refers to him as our merciful and faithful high priest. I think a very loved passage of scriptures found in Lamentations 3. Listen to it. I bet you've heard it. Verses 22 and 23 says, Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. His compassions fail not. His mercies are new every morning. His faithfulness is great. Look with me in the book of Philippians, if you would. Book of Philippians. We come now into the era of the church. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 25. Paul writes and he says, Yet I considered it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed, he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. So this man Epaphroditus was sick almost at the, the doors of death, And Paul, in referring to the healing of Epaphroditus, calls it the mercy of God. 
but God had mercy on him. In other words, God healed him, but not him only. God had mercy on me too, Paul says. You know what? When someone's healed, it's an extension of God's mercy, but not just for them. It's for their loved ones and their family, their family members as well. Now, just a little side note, but it's certainly worth mentioning. Come down to verse 30, if you would. Because for the work of Christ, he came close to death, not regarding his life to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. Epaphroditus got sick and almost died doing a good thing. But he wasn't exercising wisdom. He didn't regard his own life. Do you know what? You can be doing a good thing, but if you don't exercise wisdom, you can endanger your health. I remember when I was a Bible school student. You know, I'm a young man in my, my uh, early 20s. I'm fit. You know, and kind of you get this Superman mentality that you can just go on and on. I don't need to sleep. I don't need to eat. And I would get up at about 7 in the morning, get off to school. I'd be in classes Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. until noon. And then they had a special uh, class actually on healing, and I would stay for that. And then I would have to run when it got done, go change my clothes and zip off to work. I worked in a restaurant. I started as a cook, ended up being a waiter. And I'd be there all day long, and I would close the place down. I'd get home late, but instead of going to bed, I would stay up and study. Man, I was in the Word. I was devouring it. I was preparing my heart and my life for ministry. Hey, I'm doing a good thing. And every night I would stay up till about 3 or 3.30 in the morning just studying and praying. And then I'd get to sleep 3.30 or 4, get up at 7 the next morning and rush off to school again. And I was running on three hours, a good night, four hours sleep. And I didn't do that for just three or four days. I didn't do it for just a week. I didn't do it for two weeks. I didn't do it for just a month. I did that every day for about three and a half months. And you know what? That wasn't wise. Now, maybe you're different than I am, but my body's not wired to run on three hours sleep a night. The only candle you should burn at both ends is the candle of kindness. And you know what? My health broke down. Not just a little bit, it broke down terribly. You might say, well, Bayless, but you're doing a good thing. You're in Bible school. You're serving the Lord. You're studying his word. You're praying, yeah? But the Bible says he gives his beloved sleep. (laughs) And I was not walking in wisdom. And really, I mean, I, I got sick and it just got worse and worse. My health was so broken until I repented. I said, God... Forgive me for not exercising the common sense that you gave me and using wisdom. I repented, and then I got healed. Now, Epaphroditus, for the work of Christ, he's doing God's work, but almost died because he didn't exercise wisdom, didn't regard his own life. But even that healing, I want you to notice, and this is really the point. The Apostle Paul called it a mercy of God. You see, Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. If he was merciful then, he is merciful now. Listen to this verse, Psalm 145, verses 8 and 9. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. What a declaration about our God. The Lord is gracious. That means he's disposed to show favors. He's gracious and he's full of compassion. How much compassion does he have? He is full of compassion. Friend, when you're full of something, it overflows. God is gracious. He's disposed to show favors. He wants to show favors and he's full of compassion. And, you know, I think I understand just the smallest sliver of that because I am a dad. I get that a little. But God's mercy is infinite. His compassion, you can't measure it. I remember, went backpacking in the high Sierras. It was me, 
My dad, my oldest son, Harrison, was Monty Mock. Monty, you here tonight? Where are you? I was going to embarrass you. Monty usually sits right over in this section here. Monty was there. His dad and his son, Cody, our worship leader, Cody. Harrison and Cody were 10 at the time. So my dad had this whole trip mapped out, you know, and he kind of lives and breathes topo maps. And so he's got this whole thing. We, we you know, start and we're going to take horses about six hours up to the top of this pass. And it uh, turns out that had one sh horse short, so I had to walk all the way up. <laughs> they rode horses. And um, so we get to the top of the pass, and then it's supposed to be from the top of the pass, we're going down to a place called Rattlesnake Creek. It's going to be about two hours down. And my dad says, look, there's going to be lots of creeks running across, you know, this, this trail down. I've checked it all out. We'll have lots of water. We said, okay. So we ride the horses all the way up. I walk. They ride six hours up there. We basically exhaust all of our water by the time we get to the top. Now, the backpacks, they've been, you know, in, in uh, these mules have been carrying them. They take them out, and I knew we were in trouble because Cody put on his backpack, and he fell over backwards. And I thought, oh, no, this is not going to be good. As a little 10-year-old boy, we got too much weight in that pack. He literally fell straight over on his back. So we started heading down, and it's literally this trail that's been carved out of a solid granite mountain. And it turns out not being two hours down. It's like another six hours down to the bottom. And it was a dry winter, so all the creeks that were supposed to be running across the trail were dried up. We had no water. And on top of that, you know, they, they'd carved this thing out of the granite, and a lot of the steps we took were like about that big, so you got packs on, you're almost kind of jumping, and they were, it was far too steep for little 10-year-old's legs. And so Harrison and I, we're in the front, we're making our way down, and I'll tell you, it was a hot day. And we are so thirsty, we have nothing to drink. And we're going down, and he fell like four times, five times, six times, seven times on those sharp granite rocks because it was just, it was too big a step for his little legs. And we've been going down about four and a half hours, no water, exhausted. And I look over to Harrison, he's leaning against this rock with his pack on. And it was dusty because it was dry. He's covered in sweat. His hair is plastered to his face. He's, he's all dirty. His shins are gouged and lacerated. His little boots are full of blood. His, his shins are bloody red. And he looks at me and there's tears kind of streaming down the, you know, the, the mud on his face. And he says this is the worst day of my life. <laughs> and my heart just broke. My heart broke in two for my little boy. I said, that's it. Give me your pack. And I was tired. You know, I was the only one that didn't ride a horse, you know, up to the top of the, the path. So I had an extra six hours walking straight uphill. I was tired. I said, give me that thing, son. You're not carrying it anymore. And I carried his pack all the way down to the bottom until we got down to Rattlesnake Creek, which there was water down there. But it's just what a dad does. Compassion just flowed out of me, and I was not going to let him carry that burden. How much more? Our Heavenly Father how much more will he lift the burdens from the lives of his children that cry out to him? How much more is he willing to lift and to heal and to bless and to help his children when they are burdened down? He is a compassionate <laughs> heavenly father. Consider these declarations, if you would, and, and these are, by the way, just a fraction of what you can find in the scriptures if you begin to look. Just listen to them. Psalm 59 and 10. My God of mercy shall come to meet me. Psalm 66 and 20. Blessed be God who has not turned away my prayer nor his mercy from me. Psalm 94, 18. If I say my foot slips, your mercy, O Lord, will hold me up. 
Psalm 103 and verse 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy. Verse 11, same psalm. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. Verse 17, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. Psalm 107, verse 1, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Psalm 116, verse 5, Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. Psalm 147, verse 11, The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his mercy. God takes pleasure in those that hope in his mercy. God is pleased when we cry out to him for mercy. He's not going to say, oh, you again? <laughs> How many times is this? When are you ever going to learn? Our God. Is merciful. His mercy is great. His compassions fail not. He's full of compassion. What a Savior. Look with me at Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, if you would. Very familiar story here. Mark, chapter 10, you find the same story in some of the other Gospels, but I, I like it here in Mark. Mark 10, verse 46. Now they came to Jericho. As he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great multitude, uh, with a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet. And he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he's calling you. Throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Go your way. Your faith has made you well. This man had faith in the mercy of Jesus. He had faith in the mercy of Jesus. He knew that he was the Messiah. He called him son of David. He was a Jew. Even though he was blind, he would have been aware of all the verses that I just read to you from the book of Psalms about God being merciful and God being full of compassion. And this guy just would not shut up. He cried out for mercy. And I love, it says, Jesus stood still. So he says, Pastor, I feel like you're just trying to get our hopes up. I am. Yeah. I confess guilty. I am. God delights in those who hope in his mercy. Faith gives substance to things hoped for. If you don't have hope, faith has nothing to give substance to. I am trying to get your hopes up. I'm trying to get you to believe. I'm trying to get you to look to God, to believe that he is merciful because frankly he is more than you know James chapter 5 this will be the last place we look James chapter 5 and we're going to pick it up in verse 10 Hebrews or excuse me uh, James fifth chapter verse 10 
My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. One translation says, you've seen the conclusion wrought by the Lord in Job's case. Another translation says, remember how Job endured and how the Lord orchestrated the triumph of his final circumstances as a grand display of his mercy and compassion. Another translation says, you saw that the Lord, you saw that the Lord ended Job's suffering because the Lord is compassionate and merciful. According to the New Testament, the main lesson that we are supposed to get from the book of Job is one of God's compassion bringing ultimate victory and deliverance. You've seen what the Lord did in the end of the story. That is the lesson, that God is compassionate. God is merciful. It's not to be a lesson of perpetual suffering. Oh, well, I guess I'm just like Job. If you are, you'll have to get healed. And that's the New Testament lesson, that God is merciful. God is compassionate. And, you know, if you read the story, Job started out well, but he picked up an attitude and actually got very bitter toward God. In fact, Job admitted, you just read the book, Job talked about how bitter he was and angry, and Job basically said, God, you're doing this to me? And Job was sick. He had boils from the top of his head to his feet. He would take a piece of broken pottery, scrape them as he's sitting on an ash heap in a garbage dump. And Job says, God, I don't know why you're doing this. In fact, Job got to the point, says, God, you are unjust. I've not done anything, and, and you're unjust in doing this to me. And Job had some friends that came, sat with him for a few days, didn't say anything, and then finally they chimed in. They said, Job, God is doing this to you, but it's because you're wicked. And they accused Job of all sorts of crimes that he didn't commit. Job called them miserable comforters. He said, miserable comforters are you all. So the only difference, Job said, God, you're doing it. They said, God's doing it. But Job said, God, I'm just and you're unjust for doing it because I haven't done anything and you know it. And if I can meet with you, I tell you to your face. Slightly paraphrased, but it's exactly what he said. <laughs> Read the book of Job. And his friends say, yeah, God's doing it, but you, you, it's because you've turned orphans away. It's because you're a wicked person. You've broken people. I mean, they, they, have, they accused him of such foul things that he never, ever did. And you know, Job nor his friends could turn to Job chapter 1 and see this true source of Job's troubles. It wasn't written yet. You read in the early chapters and it says Satan smote Job with boils. Satan was the source of Job's troubles and his sickness. God hadn't done it. And you know, most theologians, almost every Bible commentator will tell you that the maximum amount of time that Job's trials lasted, they, they estimate that maximum it would have been nine months. But actually, it could have been a lot less than that. Because in the majority of the book, like 90% of the book, is one conversation that takes place in one day. Almost the entirety of the book is that. It's very easily the entire scenario could have taken place within a matter of weeks. And you know, God turned Job's captivity and Job found healing. See, we've seen the end. We saw what God orchestrated. We, we, we found that God is merciful and compassionate. And that's what we learned from Job's story. And if you read it, chapter 40 to chapter 42, you'll find out that Job's captivity was turned and Job was healed when he did two things. Some of you checked out on me because you don't like what I just said about Job because you were taught something else. You ought to read the book. Job did two things, and this is what turned his captivity. And God referred to Job's situation, being sick and having lost everything, everything that happened, God referred to it as captivity. That's the word that God used to describe it. 
and God set Job free from his captivity. Number one, Job repented. When God showed up and talked to him, Job said, I have spoken without knowledge. I put my hand over my mouth and I will say nothing else. I repent in dust and ashes. And from that point on, when he repents, God never remembers anything wrong that Job did. From that point on, God speaks of Job as being completely righteous, completely true, completely good. All of the, the accusations that Job made about God, all of the things he said, all the attitudes he had, it's a marvelous thing to read. You know what? As far as the east is from the west, so far God removes our transgressions from us. And from the moment Job repented, God never remembered or mentioned anything again, even when he spoke to Job's friends. Never brought it up. And the second thing that Job had to do, he had to pray for his friends. In fact, Job 42.10, it says, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends, and God gave Job twice as much as he had before. Job had to pray for those miserable comforters, those men that had accused him of wrongdoing, those men that had maligned him. And I'm sure that they were well-meaning. But you know what? Some well-meaning people can do some harm when they say things in ignorance. And when Job repented, when he prayed for his friends, the mercy of God touched his life. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was a healer when he walked the shores of Galilee. He is a healer today. Thank God for a wonderful Jesus. Yes, the most important thing he does is he rescues our soul and makes us fit for heaven, but he is still interested in the body. The body for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Put your trust in Jesus today. Heeft u genoten van deze boodschap? Bestel dan de volledige preek op CD of DVD. De contactgegevens staan nu in beeld. We bidden dat u blijft groeien in wijsheid, geloof en de kracht door Gods woord. Prayer is important, no question about it. But why does it seem like my prayers only reach the ceiling? And why is it sometimes so difficult to even pray at all? Bayless Conley mentions four simple steps to a fulfilling prayer life in his booklet, How to Pray. It's a framework that I use most of the time when I pray, and it, it can help you. I think most of us, if we looked at our prayer lives, they're not nearly what they should be, and sometimes something like this can just sort of help us, you know, get over the ridge, so to speak, and, and get on uh, to a little bit deeper business with God. Each step in this booklet helps you get closer to God, so you can hear and experience Him reacting to your prayers. Request How to Pray Today for a special price, free of shipping costs.